Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. In the present lecture, we will discuss the density operator or density matrix, which was introduced by von Neumann around 1927. And you can find the discussions in section 3.4, chapter 3, in the book of Sakurai, Modern Quantum Mechanics, all right? It goes from pages 174 here in the book, all right? The density operators. And the discussion on the density matrix operator extends from this page to 187. Okay. So you can check out you can check out in the book by Sakurai. Right. Well, let us just discuss the physical motivation for introducing an object called density matrix. If you are calculating the averages, so this has to do with averages. Okay. If you are calculating the average of a given operator in a pure ensemble, You need to prepare n copies of the physical system in the state psi, the same state psi. And you need to perform n measurements in that given state. And therefore, you have the average of a given operator, suppose an operator A, by the following expression. So you project out the, the, op the operator applied to psi and project out to psi. This is the average. So this is defined as the average of a given operator in a pure ensemble. You need to prepare n copies of the system in the same, exactly the same state. But usually, you want to calculate averages. So what is, what happens? For a collection of states, Suppose a psi 1, a psi 2, and a psi n. They are distinct states which appears with weights or probabilities w1, w2, wn. Okay, so you need to perform, of course, for this system, a measurement or a set of measurements and try to find out what is the average. So what happens for a collection of states? Suppose you don't have a pure ensemble. You have a mixed ensemble. So what for the average of this operator? What happens to the average of the operator? Okay, so of course you can think that the average here in the general case for a set of states would be calculating, calculated according to the following form. So there is a summation over this 
weights, so the Ws are weights or probabilities, statistical weights, and you can think that the average would correspond to Wj times the average of the operator given the state j, all right? This is what you would expect for calculating the average of this, of this operator. You have not a pure ensemble, a pure state anymore. You don't have a pure, a pure state anymore. You have a set, a collection of states when you prepare your system or your system is at a probabilistic state which you don't really know exactly what it is and you want to perform you want to calculate the average of that operator okay so wj particular states are in this state psi j. Some parts of your system are in this state psi j, another in, uh, in another state, okay? And you need to sum over. So these wj's here are weights. Of course, to give an, a probabilistic interpretation, you need that the summation of these wj's must be set equal to 1, all right? So they are normalized to unity. And this is the average of your operator. You don't have your system in a given particular state. You can have your system in a set, in a collection of states, so the Psi J's, you can calculate the average of your operator given that pure state, but now you have a collection of pure states and you have an, a mixed ensemble, all right? So this is the formula for calculating that. But now let us just rewrite this equation in the following form. So, define the definition of something called the density matrix. Okay, so this density matrix, which we will use the letter rho hat, okay, will be written in the following way. Okay, a summation over the weights and the states, which corresponds to a given basis of a given of a given operator, say, and now if we apply this row to the matrix to the operator A, we will have a summation over j, okay, wj, the operator which can act to the left or to the right. In a minute, I will prove that. But the operator is, is it can be applied first, so you, you, can, you can switch here, you can permutate. But let me continue with this notation here, so Psi J, Psi J, and the operator appearing here, okay? This is the product of this matrix times this operator, which we want to calculate the average. So this is a matrix, all right? This is a matrix. Now, let us calculate the trace. Remember the formula which was written here. 
Now, now let us calculate the trace of that matrix. Okay, the trace of this matrix, which is the so-called density matrix. All right, let us calculate the trace of that matrix. And we'll have a summation because the trace of a sum is the sum of the traces. You need just to add the diagonal terms, okay? But the sum of matrices is another matrix, and the trace is a linear operation here. So we have WJ, the trace, because this is just a number, just a constant. So if you calculate the trace of a matrix times a number, it is the number times the trace of the matrix, okay? And therefore, you have the trace of psi j, psi j, times the operator A. And now remember, matrix products are associative operations. And therefore, if you have the trace of, suppose, a matrix A, another matrix B, another matrix C, you can use the cyclic permutation here. So you can move the C in front of all the matrices A times B, okay? So you can do that for the trace. The trace of two matrices is commutative, okay? It is a commutative operation. Because the trace is the sum over, over the diagonal terms. And you can, you can show that. I will not show it here because it is a, it is a well-known result in matrix calculations. But now in, in this equation here, I can just use the fact that this is a matrix, say the matrix, the first matrix, and this is the second matrix. If I am calculating the trace, I can just permutate them. And therefore, we have the trace of rho times A is equal to the summation over J, Wj, okay, this thing here, trace of psi j times a, which is the matrix, switched or permutated with that other vector there, psi j, and notice that this is just a number. So the trace of a number is, is the number itself. It is a scalar here now. And therefore, the result is reduced to this form here. Okay? This is what we have found out. Find out. We, we find this result here. And this is just the average of the operator A, all right? This is the average of the operator A. Therefore, if you calculate the trace of the density matrix operator multiplying a matrix, which can be just permutated here, you have the average of the operator A given a collection of states you don't have you don't need to have a pure ensemble you don't need to prepare any copies of your system at the same given state you can have a collection in this collection of states you have subsystems each subsystem is in a in a state psi j and with a weight, a statistical probability, Wj, and therefore you can calculate the average of this operator. So the density matrix 
is used in the case where you don't exactly know or you don't have a preparation of a state in a definite quantum mechanical pure state. You have an ensemble of mixed states. All right? So let us just discuss a few possibilities. All right? Another important issue here is that if you're using a given basis, so properties here, a property, an important property. If you, hear, you, if you are using a given basis to expand the matrix operator, so you have the operator in, in this form here, the density matrix operator, Wj, Psi j, Psi j, okay? And uh, this is in the diagonal form because you are using something like a completeness here. You're, you have a given basis. So the diagonal of this matrix are the Wj's, all right? This is a W1, W2, until you reach the end state and zeros otherwise, given a, a basis which diagonalize some operator, okay? So the density matrix would be in a diagonal form. Notice that if you calculate the trace of this matrix itself, it is a sum of the Wj's and this is one. So this is a property of the density operator or the density matrix. The trace of the matrix itself is normalized to unity, right? Well, um, if you have a pure ensemble, you have your matrix row must be equal to a given single state, suppose the state psi. So this is just a projection operator in that specific state. And you have all the Wj's. Suppose this is some, some given W alpha here, W alpha, some state alpha in this set of states. You prepare all the states in this alpha state here. And your matrix would be written in a diagonal form. There are zeros, but perhaps in the alpha position, you have a one here and zeros, okay? So this is a pure ensemble. And only for a pure ensemble, only in this case, rho squared is equal to rho. All right, for the pure ensemble, you have this property. And the trace, of course, is one. Because for any given density matrix, the trace must be equal to one, okay? Because if you are adding up the diagonal terms, you have one only for a, a given pure state. A pure ensemble looks like that, okay? You could have also a random, a completely random state, completely random state. Or ensemble, sorry. Completely random ensemble, and therefore, your state will be given by the probabilities wj is equal to 1 over n, and each state will be with the probability or normalized coefficient, the weights, 1 over n, the summation over 1 to n, psi j, psi j. And this matrix would look like 1 over n zeros 
and once in the diagonal it is an n by n matrix so this is one over n the identity matrix okay because this is just the completeness given the basis all right given a for a given basis all right i'm using the consideration that i can expand the, the density operator in a given basis but but it, you can you can change basis all right you can change the basis and in in a in, a, in an arbitrary basis, this matrix need not to be diagonal. Of course, if you have the following rho equals to the summation over j, the weight psi j psi j, let us use another given basis. We can insert completeness. We can insert completeness here and here, so I will introduce the identity matrix both sides in another basis, okay, in another basis. Let, let me use the symbol phi, phi alphas, okay, this is the completeness in another basis, so some phi alphas. Okay? We will have Summation over alpha, phi alpha, phi alpha, psi j, psi j, a summation over beta, phi beta, phi beta, and therefore we have a summation over j, wj, here we have a number this multiplied by the phi beta is another number so we have a summation over j alpha and beta okay phi phi alpha times psi j psi j times phi beta and this is phi alpha phi beta and therefore, in this notation, we can rewrite the matrix in the following form. Because in this basis, this new basis here, okay, this is equal to the identity. In this new basis, your density operator need not to be diagonal. And therefore, you can write it as summation over alpha beta, rho alpha beta, phi alpha, phi beta and these coefficients rows alpha beta are summations over wj's in, in, in the original basis times these numbers here phi alpha projected to psi j psi j projected onto phi beta okay these are the coefficients so your matrix is no longer a diagonal matrix but of course, because you are just performing a basis transformation, the trace, which is a characteristic of that matrix, remains unchanged. And therefore, no matter the basis you are using to represent the density matrix, the trace of the density matrix is still one, okay? The, the trace of a density matrix doesn't depend on the, the basis which you are using to represent it. Okay? So in general, the density matrix, in general, your density matrix looks like the following. A set of numbers, Okay, it is a set of numbers. The diagonal corresponds to the weights given the states in a given basis. Okay, so the weights 
and these off-diagonal terms represents somehow represent somehow the probability of transitions between these states in that given basis. But of course, a summation of uh, over the entire let me use alphas here. The summation of the diagonals will be one because the trace of a matrix is unchanged by performing a basis transformation, okay, or a similarity transformation. Well, let us now consider perhaps the most important the most important ensemble, which is one of the most important ensembles in statistical mechanics, which is called the canonical ensemble. Okay? And this canonical ensemble it is derived from a definition Which is written, let me show you in page 183 in the book of Sakurai. Here, let me see. You need to define something like an entropy here, a function of entropy, right? And this function will lead to. Suppose this, the entropy is given by Boltzmann constant times this sigma here, and this sigma is calculating, calculated according to minus the trace of the density operator times the logarithm of the density operator. This is a matrix operator here. So this logarithm must be understood as a power series, a Taylor series in, in most cases, unless you are using a basis here, a given basis. And therefore, this trace would be represented as a summation. So minus KB, it's Boltzmann constant. And uh, the trace would be written as a summation over j, rho j, j, which there are only diagonal factors. Okay, this will be the form in, in a diagonal representation of the density operator. But if you calculate, if you perform a calculation which maximize the entropy, maximize sigma, because this is just a constant, you'll find out rho is equal to something like the following, the exponential of minus beta, this beta is a, is a reciprocal temperature divided by the Hamil uh, multiplying the Hamiltonian divided by the trace because this must be normalized properly and this is called the partition function. Okay, so beta, this is the this is the density matrix in the canonical ensemble. It has this form where H is the Hamiltonian. Okay. And notice that this has the form of a Boltzmann weight, but you are just replacing the energy by an operator, which is the Hamiltonian. Remember from statistical mechanics, that Boltzmann probabilities, so Boltzmann, 
distribution is of the form e to the minus beta energy. Okay, this is the form of Boltzmann distribution in classical mechanics. Of course, it is divided by something which is called the partition function. Okay, but now you replace the energy by the Hamiltonian of the system, which is an operator. Okay, beta is the reciprocal temperature. It is one over the Boltzmann constant times the absolute temperature. So Ke is Boltzmann constant. T is for absolute temperature. Of course, it is measured in Kelvin in the international system. And this beta here, this beta is called usually reciprocal of the temperature. But the normalization constant here, you can find just by imposing that the trace of a matrix rho must be equal to 1. So you have the trace of e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian divided by z equals to 1. And therefore, you find out that z is the trace of e to the minus beta Hamiltonian. This is the normalization. Okay? This is z. And this is usually the so-called partition function. Okay? Of course, you can use the basis of the Hamiltonian in the canonical ensemble, and therefore, using the basis of Hamiltonian, for which we have Hamiltonian times a given energy state E over N, o E sub index N, so some quantum numbers here, is equal to the energy of that state times the, the eigenvector here it is a complete basis. You just can expand this canonical ensemble in this way, okay, divided by the partition function here. You just need to insert the basis by the resolution of identity here, this is the identity matrix. And when you apply this operator to its own basis, you'll find out that it produces just the eigenvalue here when applied to this cat. So you have e to the minus beta e n, the states which diagonalize the Hamiltonian, divided by the partition function. This is the form of the density operator in the canonical ensemble. And of course, since you need to take the trace of the numerator to normalize the function, to find out the, the partition function, or you can use here, inserting the basis here, Okay, you can insert the basis of the Hamiltonian here. You will find out quite easily that the partition function becomes a summation over all the states of the Hamiltonian, e to the minus beta e n. Okay, this is the normalization of your system. Now we can consider another aspect. Just remember the canonical ensemble because it's very important and we will use it more often than other ensembles. 
Um, I can consider here the time dependence or time evolution of the matrix. So time evolution of rho in quantum mechanics. So suppose you have this matrix at time t equal to zero, which is corresponding to a given basis, wj, psi j, at zero, psi j, at zero. And you want to calculate the time evolution, you, you just need to replace states by its evolved counterparts okay so you just insert time here and in Schrodinger picture you also know that this is just the evolution operator applied to the state at time zero at the initial instant of time. This produces your psi j at the instant of time t. But this operator, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, is just minus i h times t divided by h bar. So this is your evolution operator. And therefore, you can set the following. Rho at a given instant of time t it is just a summation over j, wj, e to the minus i, the Hamiltonian times t divided by h bar. The psi j is at zero, but now because this is a bra, you need to switch the sign here to a plus, so plus i a bar times t divide i the Hamiltonian times t divided by the h bar, and since this operator acts on every state, you can just Pull the operators out of the summation here and you find out e to the minus i h bar times t. The summation here is just the operator at zero, at time t equals to zero. And it, it is just the evolution operator times rho zero times u dagger. So this is an equation for an operator which look like which looks like the reverse action of the evolution operators because in the Heisenberg picture you have u dagger here and u here so it is reversed but is it is in Schrodinger's picture here the evolution of rho and therefore you can take the time derivative time derivative of rho, it is equal to the derivative of u with respect to time, rho naught u dagger plus u, rho naught the derivative of u dagger with respect to time, because this is a constant in time, okay? And therefore, the time derivative of the density matrix operator corresponds here to minus i divided by h bar times the Hamiltonian times the operator u, rho naught, u dagger, the same here, but you need to take the complex conjugate, and therefore i over h bar, u, rho naught, u dagger times the Hamiltonian here, because the derivative, the derivative of u with respect to time, it satisfies Schrodinger equation. And of course, you can take the transpose conjugated of that equation. So this is 
for the evolution operator here. And now, see that this is just rho. This is just rho. You have a commutator here. So you have a commutator. V rho dt is equal to minus i over h bar a commutator of the Hamiltonian with the density operator. Of course, we can rewrite this in the following way, just multiplying by i and by h bar. And this, in Schrodinger picture, looks like a Heisenberg equation of motion which the reversed sign, okay, the opposite sign, because for an operator in Schrodinger, in, in Heisenberg picture, sorry, in Heisenberg picture, you have the time derivative here is equal to rho, the operator commutated with the Hamiltonian. Here we have the Hamiltonian commutated with that operator. And therefore there is a minus sign implied here. So, it is important to notice that matrix, the density matrix, it is a constant in Heisenberg picture. Because in Heisenberg picture, states do not evolve in time. The operators evolve in time, so there is only one operator, or perhaps this is, of course, one operator which do not evolve in time in Heisenberg picture. The density matrix is a constant in time. It is equal to, always equal to the density operator at time t equal to zero in the Heisenberg picture. But in the Schrodinger picture, It evolves according to a Heisenberg equation of motion with a minus sign or a reversed sign. So this evolution of rho operator is in the Schrodinger picture. Okay? Because if you're dealing with the Heisenberg picture, you just move the time dependence you 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 put it all, all the time dependence into the operators, the observable operators, and the states are unchanged in time. For Schrodinger, you consider the operators to be constant in time, and the states, the physical states, evolve in time. But since the density matrix is, is dependent on the states, for Heisenberg, the states do not evolve in time, so the density matrix is a constant for Heisenberg. But for Schrodinger, this is the operator which, which, which changes in time according to a Heisenberg-like equation of motion, but with a reversed sign. And this equation of motion looks very similar to a classical equation of motion for statistical distributions. It is called the Liouville equation, okay? So Liouville equation in classical mechanics, you can find out Liouville equation for statistical operators using Poisson brackets here in, in replacement of commutators. 
So if you have a classical picture here, a, a, a classical physics, you could replace the density operator here by a statistical distribution. You eliminate the IH bar, but you need to replace the quantum mechanical commutator by a Poisson bracket here. And in Schrodinger picture, the evolution of the density matrix looks, resemble closely to the classical Liouville equation of motion for statistical mechanics. Right? And the canonical ensemble is a time independent density operator which maximizes the entropy. Because if you are looking for if you are looking for a time independent for rho equals to rho naught in the Schrodinger picture also not only in the Heisenberg picture you need that the time derivative of this operator is equal to zero and therefore the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the density operator must be zero, which means rho must be a function of the Hamiltonian. It must be a function of the Hamiltonian. Otherwise, it would not commute with the Hamiltonian, right? So the density matrix which maximizes the entropy is a function of the Hamiltonian and it is, of course, that exponential of minus the reciprocal of the temperature times the Hamiltonian, apart from the normalization, which is, of course, the density matrix. Well, so far so good. Let us just consider an important result in statistical mechanics, and now we are dealing with quantum statistical mechanics, or quantum statistics. Um, if you want to calculate the average of the Hamiltonian, okay, so is an, an energy, the mean energy of the system. This is the mean energy of the system, the average energy of the system. In canonical ensemble, okay, canonical ensemble, okay, what we need to do, the density matrix is just a rho, which is e to the minus beta the Hamiltonian divided by the partition function here. So we have, in this case, a summation over e to the e to the minus beta e n. This is these are the weights. Notice these are the weights divided, of course, by z. Okay, divided by z. You can write it in the following way: divided by z. These are the weights for the nth state times the eigenkets and eigenbras multiplied this way. Okay, this is the, it came from the resolution of the identity in the basis of the Hamiltonian itself. All right, so the weight of a given energy state indexed by this label n is just equal to e to the minus beta e n divided by z, which is the partition function. Right, so we uh, we want to calculate the average of the Hamiltonian in the canonical ensemble. Okay, in the canonical ensemble, we want to calculate the mean energy of the system. And this way, we have to calculate the trace of rho times the Hamiltonian, which is the same as the Hamiltonian times rho. It doesn't matter the order here for for two operators. You can permutate them. And when you apply the Hamiltonian to this equation here, just remember that the Hamiltonian operator 
operated on one of its eigenstates corresponds to the eigenenergy times the eigenstate. And in this way, what we have here is the average of the Hamiltonian corresponds to a summation over n, one over the density, the, the partition function here, because this is a common factor. I can put it in front of the summation symbol. En times e to the minus beta en, and we need to take the trace. So if you calculate here, suppose you have the following, the trace, of the summation over n, en, en, okay? This is diagonal, and this matrix has in the diagonal the components en, e to the minus beta en, okay? And in this case, if you take the trace, you just need to sum over this factor here, and you have summation over n, en, e to the minus beta en divided by the partition function, which is e to the minus beta en summed over en, summed over n, the coefficient here, the index here. But notice the following aspect. If you pick up the partition function, which is the summation over n, of this exponential, and you calculate the derivative with respect to beta, with respect to beta, which is the reciprocal of the temperature, you calculate this derivative, you will find out a summation over n, because you are differentiating with respect to the beta, you will have minus en times e to the minus beta en. Okay, this is what you find out in this case. So this sign here, we can put in front of all the equation here and eliminate here because it's the same as multiplying every, everything by minus one. And notice this factor appears right here. So I can write it as minus the derivative of the partition function with respect to beta divided by the partition function here, all right? And therefore, the averages, and the most important perhaps is the Hamiltonian average, can be written in the following way. The Hamiltonian average, it is the minus one over the partition function, the derivative with respect to the reciprocal of the temperature of the partition function. This is a very, very important result in statistical mechanics, okay? And of course, this form of derivative, the derivative of a function divided by that function with respect to some variable, it is the same as the derivative of the logarithm of that function, because the derivative of the logarithm the natural logarithm, it is the derivative of the function divided by the function. So this minus sign here continues in front of everything. So we can, we could rewrite it as minus the derivative with respect to reciprocal of the temperature, the natural logarithm of the partition function. This is a very important result in quantum mechanics. To finish here this lecture, let me consider a very important problem. Okay, this is a very interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting problem using a two-level system. Okay, so take note of this important result here, and remember z is equal to the trace of e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian, okay? So this is the partition function. When represented in the basis of the Hamiltonian, it is diagonal, it is exponential, and you just need to add up sum over n e to the 
minus beta em. Of course, if you have a continuous label, you need to replace here by an integral over the energies, perhaps some density of states at a given energy, and the exponentials here, or perhaps you have a normalization function here, but, but it will correspond to something like that. All right, if, if your energies are a continuum, assume values in a continuum, okay? But let us consider a very, very famous application of, of this theory, which is a two-level system. Spin half particle. This two-level system, which we will consider, is spin one half particle in a magnetic field. Okay, at temperature T, which produces a beta. Beta is one over the Boltzmann constant times T. Right? This is the recipro reciprocal of the temperature. So the Hamiltonian of this particle just corresponds to some frequency omega divided by two, sigma z, and times the h bar here. So this omega, this omega is, is just twice the Bohr magneton of the particle times the magnetic field, applied magnetic field. So this magnetic field B is constant in time, okay? It doesn't change in time. Constant, and suppose it is uniform over an extent of, of the entire volume of space. So what we want to calculate here, we could calculate the energy of the system, the average energy of the system, of course, we could calculate many aspects, but now consider the Hamiltonian has the following form. Of course, you can rewrite the matrix form explicitly. So it has two given states for the magnetic uh, Hamiltonian here, the spin Hamiltonian, okay, in the presence of a magnetic field. This is the Hamiltonian. Now let us calculate. Let us calculate the following. Calculate the average of sigma z. It is it is a a question here. So the average of the spins and the magnetic. Susceptibility of the system. Okay, this is what we want to calculate: the average of spins and the magnetic susceptibility of the system. Of course, in this case, if you have a collection, you have a collection. of n spin one half particles in a volume v of the space okay you have a collection of n identical spin half particles inside a volume v okay which produces a density n this is a capital, a total number of particles divided by the volume. And of course, over the entire volume, suppose the magnetic field, which is applied to the z direction, of course, because the Hamiltonian just 
picked up the sigma z matrix, so magnetic field is applied to z direction. So suppose over the entire volume, suppose b field is uniform. That's why we need to take the into consideration that the b field is uniform. And therefore, a, a single magnetic moment of a given electron, let me use the letter mu, it is a vector, okay? Let me pick up the Z component of the magnetization because the magnetic field is applied to the Z direction. It is just the Bohr magneton. It is a minus here because they are electrons. So remember the spin and the magnetic moment for electron are in opposite directions. They are anti-parallel. And the operator for this is sigma z matrix. Of course, if you have a collection of identical spin half particles, the total magnetization of the system in z direction is given by the z component of the magnetization, which is a vector. It is measured in ampere, amperes per meter in the international system of units. It is just a summation over all the magnetic moments of all the particles from one to n divided by the volume of the system. And therefore, since each particle is identical to each other and the field is uniform, the average of this thing here, in the average, it will not depend on the position of the particles. And of course, you can replace it by some n, which is the density of particles in that volume, times because you have a summation of n n factors, this is the operator here, this is the operator for the magnetization, n times, the capital N times, divided by the volume, which produces the density of particles. Okay? Times the operator for a single particle. All right? So this is the magnetization operator. It is a quantum mechanical extension of the classical object. When you want to calculate the magnetization of a system, you consider the magnetic moments. This is the magnetic moment or dipole moment, di magnetic dipole moment. And you sum over the, the set of magnetic dipoles inside the volume V you have a total magnetic dipole, and you divide by the volume, you have the density of magnetic moments. And this is called the magnetization of the system. And here we are considering the magnetization operator in the classical mechanical version, the magnetization operator in the Z direction, because the magnetic field is applied to the Z direction, okay? So let us just sorry, let us just define some terms here. Magnetization operator of course. This is an operator in quantum mechanics. We want to calculate the average of this thing. It is just the density of particles times the operator for a single particle in the z direction, z component here. You can calculate for the x and y components, but here we are interested only on the z component because the magnetic field is applied to the z axis here. And therefore, we have minus, because they are electrons. I am supposing they are electrons in this case, or some particle with negative charges. And you 
which is the density times the Bohr magnitude, which is a number, okay? These are two numbers, the density of particles in the system, times the Bohr magneton related to spin for that particle, times sigma z, which is the poly matrix in the z direction, okay? This is what we have for the magnetization of the system. Remember from classical mechanics, classical electromagnetism, okay, you have a magnetization in the z direction for a paramagnetic system, so paramagnetic here, because for ferromagnetism you need to take into account spin-spin interactions, which we didn't discuss. And uh, in this case, you have some number, which is called the magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so this is a magnetic susceptibility. It is a non-dimensional or a-dimensional constant has no dimensions, physical dimensions, times the applied magnetic field divided by, in the international system, by something called the vacuum magnetic, uh, so this is the field divided by vacuum uh, magnetic permeability, okay, so this is vacuum magnetic permeability but doesn't do not worry too much about physical constants here okay so the magnetization of your system it is proportional to the magnetic field in the linear regime so it is supposed to be linear okay so from from Nonlinear systems, you could define the susceptibility, the magnetic susceptibility, as a derivative of the magnetization with respect to the applied magnetic field times, of course, if you derive here, times mu naught, which is the vacuum magnetic permeability. Okay, the value, physical value for this is around 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henries per meter, okay, if you want a numerical value for that constant in the international system. So 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henries per meter, okay. So this is for the magnetic susceptibility, susceptibility in the linear regime. If you suppose this is just proportional to the magnetic field, you need to just to replace that in the linear in the linear regime by something like magnetic permeability of the vacuum times the magnetization divided by the magnetic field in the linear regime okay so this applies now what we need to do to calculate this thing that's why we need to calculate the average of the sigma z right and therefore you can after that you can calculate the magnetic susceptibility of your system so let us do the job sigma z the average is just the trace of the density matrix times sigma z what is our density matrix here? It is just exponential of minus beta times the Hamiltonian divided by the partition function here. And in this case, we can use the basis which diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Remember, the Hamiltonian here is h bar omega divided by 2, sigma z. It is just proportional to sigma z, the Hamiltonian, 
And therefore, in this case, it is the same as calculating the energy average, okay? The average, the average of sigma z is just twice divided by h bar, the average of the Hamiltonian. And the average of the Hamiltonian here is the energy, the average of the energy of your system. And of course, we know that the average of the Hamiltonian is just minus one over the partition function, the derivative of that partition function with respect to the beta, the reciprocal of the temperature. So we can calculate by explicit methods here, or we can use this aspect of, of your, your magnetic system here. But in this case, we have minus beta h bar omega over 2 times sigma z divided by the partition function here, which corresponds to just the summation of the energies, the summation of e to the minus beta, the energies summed over the ends, the, the j's here, what are the possibles, the plus and the minus, corresponding to the eigenvalues of the sigma z matrix. So in our case, our partition function is just e to the minus beta h bar omega over 2, corresponding to the positive eigenstate, plus e to the minus beta h bar omega over 2. With a minus sign, we change this here, so a plus. Okay? And therefore, the partition function in this case corresponds to twice the hyperbolic cos, cos, cosine function hyperbolic cosine function of beta h bar omega over 2. This is the partition function of our system, okay? This is the partition function of this system. It's, it is twice the hyperbolic cosine, cosine function because this is the definition of hyperbolic function. So hyperbolic cosine function of some variable x corresponds to e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2. And therefore, we have exactly twice the hyperbolic, hyperbolic cosine function, right? Uh, of course, you can introduce here the basis which, which diagonalize that. It is the sigma z basis, of course. The result in the end will be the same. So if you insert here the basis, remember this is just the partition function, you will have rho is equal to e to the minus beta h bar omega over 2 times sigma z, and the completeness of the basis is here plus plus, which is the state with up spin times plus here, plus the minus minus, this is the identity matrix, and this is divided by the partition function, which we already calculated here. Of course, in this case, you could write this partition function as this density matrix, sorry, as the following. So when you apply this to this state, you have in the diagonal e to the minus beta h bar omega over 2, 1 over z is, is a common factor, zeros of diagonal terms are 0, and when you apply this to the minus state, you have beta h bar omega divided by 2, because the eigenvalue here is minus 1, so you replace the matrix by the eigenvalue when you apply to an eigenstate. So the form, in the matrix form, this is the form of this matrix. Of course, if you take the trace here, you have this plus that, okay? If you take the trace of this matrix, you have the sum of the diagonal terms. And if you need to calculate 
the partition function, you need to have the trace equal to one. So this Z factor must be exactly equal to the sum of these diagonal terms. Okay, so this is the partition function. Let us use this result here. Of course, you can calculate application of this row, apply this row to sigma Z and take the trace. Take the trace in matrix form, you have the average here. But I will calculate the following form 1 over Z, the derivative of that Z partition function with respect to beta. So you have a, cos a parabolic cosine function. If you just calculate, differentiate with respect to beta, the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine with respect to some function x corresponds to the hyperbolic sine function of x, OK? If you have an a times x, you have a times x here, some constant, and this constant appear in front of your calculation. And therefore, we can calculate, now we, we can calculate the derivative of z with respect to beta, which corresponds to the derivative with respect to beta of twice the hyperbolic cosine beta h bar omega over 2. Okay, we need to calculate this derivative here. And of course, this will produce twice h bar omega over 2, because we are differentiating with respect to this beta. So the constant h bar omega over 2 with respect to beta appears in front of everything. This number 2 is already a constant. And the derivative of the cosine is a sine function. Same argument here. This is the derivative. OK? Now, what we do? We can calculate the average of sigma z, which is twice divided by h bar omega, the average of the Hamiltonian, which in this case corresponds to minus is twice over h bar omega, 1 over z, which we already calculated is just this twice cosine, the hyperbolic cosine and the derivative of z with respect to beta, OK? So notice that minus 1 over z, the derivative of this partition function with respect to beta is just this twice cancels out because it appears in, in, in the partition function and in its derivative. So we have h bar omega over 2, a minus sign which is not cancelled out, comes from here, minus h bar omega over 2, the hyperbolic sine function divided by the proper z, which is a cosine, hyperbolic cosine function, and the sine divided by the cosine is the hyperbolic tangent. So the hyperbolic tangent beta h bar omega over 2. Okay, this is the result. When you plug in here in the calculation of sigma z, you can do that performing explicit calculation here, but I'll use the, that result. Sigma z in the average corresponds to minus the factor h bar omega over 2 cancel this factor 2 divided by h bar omega. We have minus the hyperbolic tangent of beta h bar omega over 2. This minus here just reflects the fact that the particle with negative charge, which I am assuming here, prefers to point its spin anti-parallel to the field. So it is most favorable to have a spin 
oriented in the minus z direction. So the average of the spins is a negative number, okay? And is dependent on the temperature or through, through the beta factor and is dependent on the magnetic field through omega. If you rewrite this as a function of temperature and B field here, you have minus the hyperbolic tangent, hyperbolic tangent, twice Boltzmann constant times temperature. The omega is twice the Bohr magneton, the magnetic field divided by the H bar. So we will have here H bar times this omega, you will have magneton, Bohr magneton times magnetic field twice. And this cancels out this factor of two here. So if you plug in the, the factors, this will correspond to the following. Okay, the two cancel out, the twos cancel out, and you have that expression. Now, if you have to calculate the average of the magnetization operator, you just need to have minus n Bohr magneton and the average of spins. And therefore, the minus is canceled out. So the magnetization on the average is oriented in the same direction of the applied magnetic field. You have density of particles, Bohr magneton here, and the hyperbolic tangent of Bohr magneton times B divided by Boltzmann constant times temperature. Okay, this is the expression which you could find in a similar fashion here for the, it's calculated the magnetic susceptibility in page 187 of Sakurai, 187 of Sakurai, right? So this expression here is a very interesting, a really one uh, expression here. It is very interesting because if we calculate the magnetization considering the applied magnetic field, which could be written as new naught times the magnetic field H in amperes per meter, but usually in quantum mechanics, you replace this field, magnetic field intensity by the magnetic field induction, induction symbol because the H is usually the Hamiltonian, so you, you can be confused by that fact. And therefore, it is common to use B for magnetic field intensity also. So if you plot this function here, given a temperature, you'll find out the following. A magnetization on the average, it is the average of the operator, B field here, you'll find out something like this. A hyperbolic tangent is symmetric under inversion. It does not present theoretical aspects. And in the limits, in some limits for very high applied magnetic fields, you can polarize all the spins towards the direction of the field. And this limit here is n times the magnetic moment of a single particle. And this n is the density of particles. Of course, if you reverse the sign of the field, you have minus n times the Bohr magneton because the hyperbolic tangent 
when the argument goes to infinity, it goes to unit. And for minus infinity, it goes to the minus one. So this is a saturation curve. It saturates. high B over the temperature. If you have a very small temperature or if you have a very high field, your system saturates. All the spins will align to the field. Okay? Or if you have a very small temperature, no fluctuations, the system goes to the smallest, to the lowest energy level. And the lowest energy level, if you have a, a tiny magnetic field, it is sufficient to put the spins aligned to that small, very small field. Okay. Um, of course, for smaller temperatures, for lower temperatures, the tangent it saturates, saturates first, okay? So this is for temperature T1, and in red curve, I have a temperature T2, and T2 is higher than T1, okay? So exactly at zero, you have a function which appears to be step-like, okay? So it's zero temperature at zero field you don't know if the system is in the minus state or in the plus state at zero field but since you apply the smallest amount of magnetic field it will saturate if the field is slightly positive it will saturate in the positive sense if you apply a negative field it will saturate in the negative direction or sense of, of the z-axis. But if you increase temperature, we know temperature auments the, the entropy of the system and the system will, not, will no longer saturate so easily. So temperature introduces disorder into your system. A totally ordered system would, would correspond to a totally aligned spins. But if you increase temperature, spins fluctuate. And this fluctuation presents itself by these curves. So raising temperature produces a, perhaps a, what can I say? produces this effect here, the smearing of the, the hyperbolic tangent. So you will need a very high magnetic field to saturate. If you increase temperature to saturate, you need to, to apply a higher magnetic field value to saturate your system, okay? So this function here, this mz function, corresponds, of course, to n times the magnetic moment of a single particle, this n is the density of particles, times the hyperbolic tangent of something like Bohr magneton times B divided by KBT, all right? So this is the function which is represented in this graph. Now we can calculate the magnetic susceptibility in the linear regime susceptibility in the linear regime okay and in this case you need to have a tangent, the hyperbolic tangent of Bohr magneton times B divided by KBT. And into, because if you have a small argument, 
of x, the hyperbolic tangent is proportional to the argument. So you will find out it will be the Bohr magnetron times B divided by KBT, okay? And it occurs if B divided by T or this factor here in, in proper units divided by this factor here is much less than unity. Okay, if you have this argument here less than one, you can approximate the tangent by a linear function in the relation B over T. Okay, so this is linear. And in this case, the magnetization average or the average of the operator will become approximately N, which is the density of particles. A Bohr magneton already appeared, but now I have to replace the hyperbolic tangent by the linear representation. And in this way, we have N times the Bohr magneton squared here, divided by KBT times B. And the susceptibility it is just in the linear regime, the magnetic susceptibility is just the magnetization average divided by the B field. So if we divide this by B, we have N times the Bohr magneton divided by KBT. This is the magnetic susceptibility of your system. For small, for, for when B over T is a small quantity, all right? Lower than one in, in proper units. You need uh, to be precise. You need to multiply B by Bohr magneton and you need to multiply temperature by Boltzmann constant. So remember, you, you need to multiply it by the mu zero, which is the magnetic permeability of vacuum. So mu zero appears here if you are dividing it by the B field, okay? If you divide it by the B. But notice that you have a constant. Your magnetic susceptibility, it is a constant divided by the temperature. And this constant, it is in proper units N or magneton squared, mu naught divided by Boltzmann constant. Okay, if you, it depends on, on the units you are using. So this constant here, it is given by properties of your system, the density of particles, which have a unit of dipole moment equal to the Bohr magneton or wherever the magneton is, you, you could replace here. Notice that it is squared. So for positive or, or negative particles, it will be the same. And it's divided by Boltzmann constant here. So this is a, just a constant. And this magnetic susceptibility applies for systems at high temperatures small magnetic fields, it is just a hyperbolic uh, hyperbola, okay? One over T, this is proportional to one over T. So if you measure the susceptibility as a function of the temperature, you'll find out that the magnetic susceptibility of your system decreases with increase of temperature. It makes sense because for higher temperatures, you need more magnetic field amplitude to polarize the spins, okay? Because temperature introduces disorder. If you increase temperature, you need to increase the field to align the spins in the direction of that field. And in this case, you 
see that the susceptibility, the response of your system to the applied magnetic field is lowered by the temperature. Temperature introduces more disorder. And therefore, your system responds according to this function of temperature. For, of course, for this condition, Here, okay, much less than unit. Okay, this needs to be valid for this to be experimentally for for experimentally this this scenario making some sense. Okay, because this is the approximation. You need a linear regime. In paramagnetic systems, you can saturate. If you apply very high, very high fields. So if you calculate, you can calculate the susceptibility, okay, as a function of any given field. So this will, will be a function of the field. And for any value of the field, it is no longer linear. So this is linear. If you want to calculate a nonlinear regime, you need to go here. Same rules apply for a bunch of analogous systems. If you have a two-level system, you can find what, what this means, this susceptibility is the response function of your system. It corresponds to some response function. So if you have a Two level system, you have something which is analogous to the magnetization, you have something which is analogous to the susceptibility of your system, the magnetic susceptibility, and you have an input which is the analogous of your magnetic field, and you will have a response function which is a function which, which will depend on 1 over T for high temperature. Okay, at high temperatures and small stimulus of your system. It is very general. You could consider, for instance, the, the electric response of your system, of course. If you have two states aligned to the electric field or anti-parallel to the electric field for a given molecule, for instance, you have a an electric dipole and your response would be the same analogously you have a, the electric susceptibility with, which is a constant divided by temperature at high temperature if you could model your system by a two level system by a two level problem okay now let me finish this right here Next, we will apply the, the density matrix to a bosonic collection of particles or a collection to a bosonic particles, okay, non-interacting particles and to fermionic non-interacting particles. And we will find out Bose-Einstein and the Fermi-Dirac distributions. I will let that to a next lecture. To do that in the, in the next lecture so hope you can find it useful bye bye